when I was at Evangel and teaching the integration class for our counselors to be school counselors or LPC, I started teaching the integration class and came across a model of integrating faith, your practice, and, and, and your counseling. And, the fundam- and it's both in the American Psychological Association as well as in the American Counseling Association, both recognize you have to address religious spiritual issues with your clients in school, whatever. But what was fascinating, the, the premise for their tenets of starting their models was, we believe God is divine and wants to communicate with people. Very first line. And that's, that really hit home for me. It, it, it kind of like, okay, what do we... And so that's what we're going to practice tonight. How do we do that? How do we go that route? Um, so what we're going to do, uh, let me just give you an overview. I'm going to do a, a self-care. This, I wish I had done this 10 years ago. Because um, there's some incredible stuff here I want to share with you. Um, then we're going to do a quick review of the ABC model and the parasympathetic system. Oh, I think, can I share that one little, I don't know who the person was, but they were watching the Kansas City Chiefs game, and the wife texted pastor and said, so-and-so is practicing activating his parasympathetic nervous system. He's watching golf right now on the TV. <laughs> That's good. I think a lot of us could have switched, maybe. But but Cardinals, 16 in a row. St. Louis Cardinals, yes, go Cards. So um, that that was my parasympathetic system. But I'm gonna we're gonna look at. I want you to think about now. What is one of your fears that you have that is kind of fresh in your mind, working through you? We're gonna work your way through that, and then I want you to think about something in your life about yourself that keeps tripping you up, keeps weighing you down, uh, something you would like to discard. And we're going to try to look at that as well with the exercise that we're going to do tonight. And then we're going to close in an extra, um, we're going to take those fears and we're going to just lay them at the altar at some level. And, and so that when you leave here, I'm believing the Lord will have communicated directly with you. And you will say, September 26th, 2021, I left that issue at the altar, and it no longer is a problem for me. That's what we're going to work on tonight. So we'll start this self-care. Um, this study that started this, I was asked to speak at the new missionaries for the AG uh, U.S. missions. And burnout's a big deal amongst ministers. Uh, so Pastor Chad is going to love some of this research, but because it is like 80% of those surveyed. Is it, go ahead and next slide. Is it working? This study, 338 ministers, different denominations. They were veterans. They'd been in the ministry for quite a while, but 70% Moderately or strongly disagreed with the statement, I feel fulfilled in my ministry. 70%. 67% agreed to strongly agree with the statement, I sometimes project my job frustration on the family. I think a lot of us do that. That's why I tell when you come home, give that spouse 30 minutes to de-escalate. Don't put any pressure demands Just let that person, let what system kick in? Parasympathetic system, yeah. 62% agreed to strongly agree with the statement, sometimes my outward appearance seems happy and content, while inside I am emotionally distressed. 75%, I'm afraid to let my parishioners know how I really feel. Check this last one. 80% agreed to strongly agreed with the statement, I feel guilty if people see me taking time off during the week. So that's ministers. And then we can project that. The missionaries, um, I believe I know my grandpa, Harold Jones, 54, died of a heart attack. And I'm firmly convinced that if he had done more self-care, 
he probably would not have died that young. Uh, we have heart disease in the family, but I still believe you, how you take care of yourself. And that's what we're going to talk about today. All right, so go to the next one. The, the, this is where I want to start. What is compassion? Why do I put this here? Christians, want, it doesn't take long. Once you look at the Bible, you realize we have an orientation to other people. True or false? I mean, it's just like once we become Christian, it's like go into the world, whatever that, if that's next door or around the world, there's an element we are supposed to get involved in people's lives. Many Christians have what? Compassion. We should have compassion. I love compassion. That's what motivates me, motivates you. So what is compassion is a caring response. It's something that lets you, oh, I see a need, and I jump in there, and I try to do something about it. That's compassion. Um, Caring response to suffering that acknowledges the shared condition or imperfection and involves turning toward rather than denying or avoiding people's pain. All right? That's a good thing, isn't it? We want Christians to be compassionate. All right? I mean, that's, this church thrives, grows, because some, there's compassion here. When you come to this facility, you know people care for you, get involved in your life, minister to you, show compassion. Uh, it's an open heart way of relating to the world. Uh, it's also kind of an emotion. It's felt response to perceiving suffering that involves an authentic desire to ease the distress. So let's go to the next one. Next one, what is empathy? Empathy is that mindset I can put myself in your shoes, in your worldview, and look out through your eyes and see the world as you see it and hear it and feel it without losing myself. Okay. That's important, too, to be a good counselor, good pastor, good teacher. We have to have empathy. Yeah. We have to be able to see the world from that person's perspective. So it's awareness of self and others. So what this compassion is empathy and action. So you see that person's world needs, issues, and then you try to do something about it. And I've said this many times, being a good Christian really can be messy at times. True or false? It should be. It's like we're driving along and there's somebody there that's in need. And we say, oh, I'm late to church. I got a job. Should I stop and help? And we go through that whatevers. Okay. So compassion is empathy in action. So there's an inverse relationship. So inverse relationship means when one variable goes up, what happens to the other one? It goes down. Yeah, we've got some good college students in here. So when fear goes up, what happens to compassion? Goes down. Insecure attachment to what happens to attachment or companion, or, or excuse me, uh, compassion. So if you're insecure attached, you are less likely to do what? Become involved compassionately. Relational wounds can interfere with our ability to be compassionate. So we're there. So we got empathy. Let's understand. Compassion is empathy in action. Okay. So we're all good with this, right? So here's the next part that is going to be a struggle for you. And that is, what is self-compassion? Can we go? What is self-compassion? It's the same thing. It's that same compassion that you show other people, you show now to who? Yourself. And so when, it, when the Bible talks about sacrificing or laying our, alt, our egos down and at the cross, that's not giving up self-compassion. Right? It's compassion turned inward. The same amount of grace and understanding and empathy you give to someone else that is wounded and hurting or harmed you or sinning or making a mistake or betrayed you, you are to do the same thing to yourself. 
So when you make a mistake, when you sin, when you blow it, what should we do? Give ourselves the same compassion, the same grace, the same love, the same mercy that we give to other people. Almost all of us are harder on ourselves than on others. Yeah, it's almost like I'm always got to put myself down. And that's the missionary model that just drove me nuts was we sacrifice for everybody. And then what happens to the missionary, him or herself? Crash and burn. Or their family is neglected. So that, that's, this is really something big in my family that, we're, that I'm working on. So self-compassion involves being caring and supportive towards ourselves. When we suffer, even when our suffering stems from personal failures or perceived inadequacies. So let's go to the next slide. How many of you are good at self-compassion? Hmm. <laughs> We're all in the same boat, aren't we? When was the last time you told, someone ever said from a pulpit, you need to love yourself more? Anybody? I'm telling you, you need to love yourself more. Let me say it again. Love yourself more. Why? Because you'll be more effective in the kingdom of God if you have a greater love for yourself. Because then you can put your agenda aside when you need to, to help other people. And you won't be taken advantage of. You won't be neglected, abused per se, because you can then set boundaries for yourself. The more love you have for yourself, the more you're going to have for other people. It involves framing our experiences of imperfection and failure in light of the shared human experience, accepting that all people struggle in some form or another. Self-compassion, go down, it also offers more emotional stability than self-esteem because it is always available even in instances of disgrace and failure. One of the things I hope tonight that you will look at something that maybe you feel inadequate, you failed, you messed up, and it still kind of haunts you. And you haven't really let it go, forgiven yourself. I'm hoping tonight will be a night where that's gone. And you'll walk away in the freedom of Christ. That's, that's, that's my prayer. That's what I've been working on. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is some research um, let's go to the next one. Oh, self-compassion is not being selfish. How many of you um, love it when your battery on your phone dies? <laughs> Who loves that? I kind of do, because then you see students actually, oh, they become alive, they get a little nervous and get some energy. But we have to do what to that instrument if we want to keep using it? It has to be recharged. Your bodies need to be recharged. And who's the only one responsible for doing that? Ourselves. Ourselves. So look at these studies about self-compassion. This is a psychologist in me. I've got to show this stuff. This is really interesting. I'm, I'm excited about this. But anyway, I hope you not fall asleep too much. But 20 studies, large effect size between self-compassion and lower levels of psychopathology, anxiety, depression, stress disorders. It results in less, less self-criticism. The more you have self-compassion, then less likely you won't have anxiety, depression, or stress disorder. Self-compassion exercises lower state levels of cortisol. What is cortisol? The stress hormone that destroys your body physiologically eats it if it stays there too much and too long. Self-compassion does what? It neutralizes it. 
It increases heart rate variability, which is associated with a greater ability to self-soothe, self-regulate. Self-compassion affects your psychobiological threat system and activates your self-soothing system, the polyvagal theory. Who's heard of the polyvagal theory? It is the up-and-coming theory. It's amazing about how the certain, um, I think it's cranial nerve 10, I think it is. If that is activated, it does so many wonderful things in the body. And so it's, there's some really neat research going on. i got to learn more about that. Self-compassion was significantly negative cor- negatively correlated with clergy burnout. So the more self-compassion, the less likely you are going to burn out. I know you've got a lot of students here, and so many times students will try to do an all-nighter to study, right? Any student in here that's not done an all-nighter for a test or a paper? Oh, we've got a couple of smart ones. Um, the reason being for that is you need at least three REM cycle sleeps before you take the test. What does that mean? That's at least four, about an hour and a half, so at least four and a half, five hours of sleep. Because whatever you've been studying, if you don't sleep, it will not get encoded into your brain. So get that sleep. At least what? Five hours. I know that's not a lot. But we have to do that to, in order to take care. So self-compassion. Let's go to the next one. Here's some benefits. Less negatively affected by suffering. Participants with higher self-compassion have stronger motivation to change for the better, to try harder to learn, to avoid past mistakes, and have higher intrinsic motivation and perceived self-efficacy. Anyone understand what I just said? (laughs) There are two words there. That if I know where you are with those two constructs, I can determine probably how successful you will be at any task that you go after. What are the two? Intrinsic motivation and perceived self-efficacy. Intrinsic motivation is I'm I'm doing the act not to get a reward, but to fulfill some internal need of mine. Do you serve the Lord? To get a reward, eternal security, or you'd serve the Lord because you know he died for you and paid a great price for you. To get a reward, extrinsic. Because he paid a great price for you, intrinsic. Makes a world of difference in how you handle suffering. Self-efficacy is the, the belief that you have in your own self to accomplish a task. And if you believe you can do something, more than likely, you will. If you can't, then what do you do? You try once, doesn't work, stop, move on. Huge thing. Self-compassion helps both of those. Taking care of yourself, being merciful to yourself, giving yourself grace. Self-compassion. Oh, self-compassion is a better predictor of whether or not veterans develop PTSD, despite the level of combat exposure. A lot of the guys I've worked with, and gals, that, that guilt, survivor guilt, or what, it, it just haunts on them. They've got to find a way to be compassionate to themselves. People scoring high in trait self-compassion or who are induced to be in a self-compassionate frame of mind also tend to experience more happiness, optimism, curiosity, creativity, and less self-critical. The research is phenomenal. We're not talking about being selfish, narcissistic, egocentric. We're talking about self-compassion. This even works in different cultures, and we're more likely to forgive others. So let's go, I think, next slide, please. So here's, this is uh, theology of self-care. They're all questions. I'll let you answer the questions. You can see where I'm going with this. 
Why did God instill the criticalness of the Sabbath and keeping it holy? Why? In fact, when you read the Old Testament, the Lord got really bent out of shape, not just do their disobedience, but when they didn't observe the Sabbath. I mean, it's over and over and over. You did not, you did not keep my Sabbath holy. There's a reason for that. Why? We don't tend to have a Sabbath. I have started my own Sabbath. I pick a day. It's Sunday that I do it, and there are things I don't do on Sunday that I normally do other days. Just, nope, that's my Sabbath. I want to honor you, Lord. You can choose whatever day you want to do that. But think about that. Why? He wanted people to rest. Why did God instill all the annual festivals and celebrations for the Jewish people? Do you realize every celebration was party hardy time? Big time. Yom Kippur, one day of what? Grieving and, and fasting. But then after that, the next 14 days, it's party hardy. Let's bring out the cake, bring out the meat, bring out the wine. It was like everybody have a good time. Why? Why did Jesus get alone with his father? You ever wonder about that? And I don't think it was to get his marching orders. Oh, I think he already knew that. Just wanted that fellowship, connection. How do we take care of the temple of the Holy Spirit? How are you taking care of the temple of the Holy Spirit? Just beat it, grind it to death by working 80 hours a week, not resting? Uh, that one gets me. And I, and I know that we all have different physiologies. So, but I'm just saying, what are we doing to take care of his temple? I, I love that phrase. Christ in us, the hope of glory. What does, it, uh, what does it mean that we are to be good stewards of the gifts and abilities he has given us? Are we going to be held accountable on what we did with our talents? How are you taking care of those talents? Are you grinding them into the ground? <laughs> or are you sharpening the axe, recharging the battery, having your Sabbath getting alone, meditating with the Lord, getting that spirit at peace. What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? Have you ever thought about that? I think there's something there. We, we, the more, that's what I said earlier. The the, 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 the the assumption behind that is God thinks and believes that we do love ourselves. And out of that love, then we show it to other people. Let's go to the next slide. So, <clears throat> self-care strategies. I'm just, this is my segue into where we're going to go shift next. But <clears throat> I, personal self-care. What you feed will grow. True or false? Which is easier to grow, weeds or roses? Dandel yeah, dandelions, do you have to do anything to let dandelions? In fact, if you leave them alone, they do probably do better. <laughs> Correct? Now, yeah. now, roses, on the other hand, they, they're finicky. Sometimes the antique roses seem to be doing a little bit better, but the others... What you take care of, what you feed, will grow. So, be alone 15 minutes a day. These, these are not big stuff here. Not run a marathon. Eat healthy. Sleep at least seven hours a night if you can. I mean, five days of 15 to 20 minutes of physical exercise. Do something fun each day. Talk to friends and spouse for at least 15 minutes a day. Just connect. Those of you that are in... in, in 
your, your marriages, one of the things I try them to do is, well, if the kid's gone to bed and everything's settled down, they sit at the table, or count, and for 15 minutes, how was your day? Where are you at? What's going on? Just simple 15 minutes can change that relationship in a very powerful way. If you have kids, play with them every day for at least 15 minutes. That's not that long. They have to have that sense, I'm valued. My parents want to be with me. I mean, when my adult kids now, hey, Dad, why don't you come over and hang out with us? I'm, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> because that didn't happen when I was at their age with my parents, because they were overseas, missionaries. So I'm learning to accept that. Take an annual, at least one-week vacation every year, in addition to the regular holidays. A study that alerted me to this is they did a study to see what was the difference between juvenile delinquent boys and non-juvenile delinquent boys. And they had history on all of them. Socioeconomic status, careers, the works. Guess what the one variable that predicted the non-delinquents from the delinquents? You know where I'm going. The non-delinquents, their parents had a vacation at least once a year. And it didn't have to be a real fancy-dancy one. It could be just going to the lake, put up some tents, and that made a difference between delinquency and non-delinquency. Just that, one week. Underlying issue of that, what is that? You're taking interest and investment in your children, and you're demonstrating that. And saying, you are important, we're going to do this. So I encourage you to do that. Oh, and if you're married, at least one date a month, if not every week. Yeah, I know. But nonetheless, that's... Date night should be regular, and the kids should know that. We don't mess with that night. That's mom and dad's date night. Oh, love it. Love it. All right, let's go. To the, now, let, I think one more slide. All right, so this is my self-care. So my wife, about four years ago, she knew I was going to retire, and I, I worked two jobs. So I'm not a really good, I'm learning this self-care myself, full-time at Evangel, full-time at my private practice. So I had to find things. She said, Grant, you're going to retire. You're going to have to find a hobby. So I decided to find a hobby. Guess what that hobby is? Hunting. Okay? I, and I, ho I'm, I hope I don't offend anybody with this, but, but it, it's my, it's, and you can see my boys and my grandkids are involved in those deer. It's kind of a little, boy, that's a fuggy. Well, anyway, those are, those are pretty good deer. You just ask Pastor Chad. Because uh, he's drooling over there, but that's all right. And, <laughs> and I go to Africa every year with students. That's at the equator in Kenya. And we do clinical work at an orphanage, a high school, and Teen Challenge. And I just, I go home. <laughs> that's how it feels like to me. Because um, that's where I was raised, in, in Africa. And then the next slide. Now, this one, please don't. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. Uh, the meat was eaten by everybody and the skin's taken care of. But I had a dream of replicating my dad's animals that he shot in, in East Africa. And he got a Cape buffalo. And so that's what that is on the left. Um, and it's, they call it Black Death. And it's shot it at 40 yards and... And then, then a zebra, and I don't have a picture of the impala, and, uh, but I'm going back again uh, this next March, trying to talk pastor to come with me, but he's kind of iffy on that. But anyway, um, he needs a sabbatical. Don't you think he needs a sabbatical? I'm trying, pastor. <laughs> uh, so I think that's my last slide. Is there one more? I can't remember. Oh, what you feed will grow. We are finite human beings who can't do it all. Doing self-care and self-compassion makes you a more effective witness and servant in the kingdom of God. It will make you a better student if you do self-care. That's biblical. 
All axes and chainsaws eventually need sharpened, and batteries need recharged in order to do their jobs. And get a, ho get a hobby. Truth, the healthier you are, the healthier your career will be. Better teacher, mechanic, president, counselor. The healthier you are, the healthier you will be in the kingdom of God. And so one of the first steps is to exercise self-compassion. All right, so now I want to do something that I think that's the last one, right? Now we'll go ahead and shut that one off. I want to do a quick review, not much. What are the two key ingredients in handling anxiety? Not quite, but that's close. But from this morning. This morning we said, anxiety. Yeah, I haven't had any REM sleep. That's why I can't remember. Smart. That is good. Absolutely. I haven't had REM sleep, Dr. Grant, so I don't know what you said this morning. Autonomic nervous system. If you can control the parasympathetic and sympathetic interplay, then you control what? Your anxiety. Absolutely. And then the other one is mistaken beliefs. Exactly. Way to go. So we got, and that's that ABC model. It's not the actual event that has the consequences. It's the interpretation of the event that makes the conflict, whether an appropriate response or an inappropriate response, inappropriate response. So what we're going to do now is uh, if you have some sort of phone or utensil, paper, I know you probably, um, I, I want you to kind of have something that you can write on. If you can't, okay, I'm, um, we will, I, I should have said something this morning. Um, but while you're doing that, I want, I want to show you this interplay, Okay. So what I want you to do, just kind of where you're sitting, I want you to take your pulse. Okay? Find out what's your pulse. If you don't know how to find your pulse, it's probably some of you have phones or, or watches, right, that do that for you. Ah, this is a crazy day. So, but if you want, you can just right here on your wrist or up here somewhere on your... Okay? So find out what your pulse is right now. Just... Just do that. You don't have to tell anybody, but figure it out. Okay. When, when you got it, just kind of put your little finger up or something. There you go. Because I want to make sure everyone's got it before we switch. I want to show you the power of the mind. So everyone got your resting, poten resting potential. Oh. Resting pulse. Do you know what a resting potential is? Someone tell me you know what that is, because I'm be really impressed. Resting potential is negative 55 millivolts in an, a nerve impulse. But anyway, now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about something really nasty, bad thing that happened to you in the last couple of years. Just think about it, experience it, relive it, recall it, spend some time there. There's a car wreck, illness, COVID response. Just be there for a moment. Just think about it. Okay, now take your pulse.
Everyone got your second pulse? How many of it, it went up? Raise your hand. How many went down? Okay. All you did was do what? Change your thinking. Now, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to think about one of the most relaxing places in the world that you would love to go to. If you have to create your happy place, we're going to need this later on. But if it's a place, an island or mountains or cabin or cruise or whatever, I want you to go there now and be there. This is going to be your happy place. I want you to spend some time there. And let your senses work for you. Take in what you see, what you hear, what you smell. Walk around. Now take your pulse. How many went down? How many went up? How many stayed the same? How many went below your resting one? All we did was do what? Changed your thinking, and it changed your physiology of your body. When Paul, you know, take captive every thought. So that's what we're going to try to teach you when it comes to fear and anxiety. If I can take captive those thoughts, then I'm going to be able to activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So now what I want you to do, you got that piece of paper, you got your phone or whatever. I want you to write down, there's th- uh, what is my current fear? Kind of like put that in a sentence or two. What is my current fear? What is my con- current worry or concern. What is my current fear, worry, concern? What's at the forefront of your awareness? Here's the second question. What is the likelihood probability of it happening based upon facts. Write your answer to that. I'll repeat that. What is the likelihood, probability of it happening based upon objective facts, not subjective? And then the third one. If it were to happen, what could you do? What are your options? So take a look at that now, all right? What have you noticed? First of all, high probability, low probability. 
and based upon objective facts. Like maybe one is, I, I'm going to lose my job. All right. Anyone ever not had that <laughs> experience? But what's the probability? Objectively, what are your reviews? What are your outcomes, your productivity? For you college students, guess what the number one predictor of performance is? Past performance. So if you're an A-B student in the past, guess what you're going to be in the future? There you go. If you're a C student, then that's what you'll be unless you do what? Change your process. So a battle in the mind. And then if it were to happen, Albert Ellis in his, he's one of the gurus in cognitive therapy, he says, what you need to do is imagine what's the worst thing that can happen? <laughs> yeah, Albert, that's nice to hear. But then you think about it. Will you still be okay? Is there, are there still options? And that depends. But the idea still is, most of the time, what we imagine is going to happen rarely or often happens. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to leave that with you, and I want you to hold on to that fear because we're going to come back to it. Now, <clears throat> we're going to go, I need this, well, let me, first of all, I want you to identify something or situation about yourself that bothers you or trips you up. I want you to think about that now. You're never going to share this with anybody. Fair enough? And what I'm going to have you do now is totally voluntary. If you just want to stay there and just watch and observe, that's fine. There's no pressure to do any of this. But this one is more of a meditative process. I am going to teach you how to do guided imagery work. It's being recorded. So It'll be interesting if you ever want to see how to do it, or you can use this. My clients will take their cell phones, and they'll put it on record, and they'll record what I'm saying to them so that they can go back and walk through it until it becomes a, a, a habit, so to speak. So the first thing I need you to do, find that one thing. Now, I want you to get comfortable somewhere, all right? If you need to move somewhere or change, you just I need you to be comfortable. So if you're where you're at, that's fine. Um, you're going to close your eyes in a minute. And so you want to make sure you've got a comfortable place. Um, if you want to sit on the ground or in the corner, it doesn't matter to me. Just find a nice, safe place. Now, ladies that have had babies, this next part they are experts at, and that's breathing effectively. Lamas. Lamas. How many know what Lamas breathing is? Yeah, good stuff. I found out later on. I was a coach for my wife, for our first son, and um, don't eat a Whopper with onions before you're... <laughs> coach it just I was I wasn't I'm an MK I don't know you're not supposed to eat before you coach and so <laughs> we still laugh about this today I just I remember her hand went right in my face something she's being violent I'm trying to help her breathe <laughs> all right so one of the first things to activate the parasympathetic nervous system is through your breathing. You want oxygen to get into your bloodstream, and that's a trigger right away. Okay, time to relax. And there's a way to breathe. You breathe in through the nose. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. And then blow it out. Hold it, hold it, hold it. 
See, when you do this, you know you're looking like a fool. And so you forget about all your fears and your troubles because you're just like, I'm sorry. That's the truth. So breathe through your nose, exhale through and make a sound when you're doing it. Why? I want you to condition that sound to relaxation. As I'm walking to class or going to the next class, I will go. And it instantly, guess what's happening to my parasympathetic? I've conditioned that. When it hears that sound, it's chill. And I go on to do. All right, so here's what I want you to do. Just, okay, know, you know where your happy place is. All right, so I want you to get comfortable. That happy place, please have water there. Try to have some water there. Only you can get there. No one else is allowed, permitted. You're the only person that knows how to get there and be there. And so when you're there, you are going to be by yourself. Okay. Those of you that are left hemisphere folks, raise your hand. Left hemisphere. You don't have any creativity almost in you. I am a left hemisphere. I cannot be hypnotized. They've tried. Because my right brain does not exist, I don't think. And just, I'm so analytical. So this, so those of you, like, I can't dream in color, see in color. I I just can't do it. And there's actually a name for that. Did you know that? I forgot the name. But there is a name for some, a client told me that. There's, Grant, you know there's a disorder for you. Oh, that's encouraging. But (laughs) I don't, I'm going to have to figure, I have to Google it. But it's, you don't dream in color. You don't see in color. Uh, But anyway, those of you that are left brain have some difficulty with this. So what I do is I go to a place that I've been to. Where I go to is Yankari Game Reserve in Nigeria, where out of this huge cliff comes this massive 800,000 gallons of water an hour, whatever, and it feeds the whole plain where the animals are. And it's, it's warm, it's sandy, it's awesome. And I go there, all right? So that's what I want you to try to do now. All right, so what, here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do the breathing. You already have your safe place. Then I'm going to have you walk out of the building in your mind to a cloud. You're going to get on the cloud. You're going to lay down on the cloud. And the cloud is going to take you to your happy place, safe place. And I'll have you do some things while you're on the cloud. And now you're all looking, he is such an idiot. And we're paying him for this. Ah, man, I want my refund. But trust me, it's going to work. And... That cloud, then you're going to do some things in the cloud. I'm going to make sure we're going to activate all your senses. Your vision, tactile, sense, auditory, it's going to be part of that process. Then the cloud's going to take you to your safety place, happy place. You're going to engage there. It's going to come down. You're going to walk. I hope there's water there. The water is nice and warm. You're going to take your shoes off. You're going to walk in the grass, the sand. You're going to sit back in a hammock or a rocking chair. Whatever is unbelievably soothing to you. Okay? Then when you're there, I'm going to ask you to invite Jesus to come visit you. See, I have no idea what will happen there. That's between you and he. And have him just sit down next to you, talk, communicate, and tell him about what? That concern that you have, the thing that you have, you've held on to, have been unable to let go. And listen to what he has to say to you. And then we'll bring you back. You'll watch Jesus kind of move. Some of you may not be able to have Jesus there. That's okay. It's very hard for me to do that because why? I have no right brain. Those of you who do, and this is very, I've had a, oh, many clients that that's where I say, hey, go see Jesus right now. And you just see their visage. Calm down. Okay, so, and then I'll bring you back here from the, you get back on the cloud and you'll come back here. That's what we're going to do. I know you're all looking at me. This guy is strange. <laughs> uh, you should see your faces right now. Okay. All right, so breathing. Let's go. <clears throat> 
So <clears throat> start your breathing. Everybody close your eyes, get comfortable. In through your nose. I am relaxed. Again. Hold it, hold it, hold it, and exhale. Again, inhale, fill up those lungs with some beautiful oxygen, and let it go. While you keep breathing, I want you to do a body scan. Start with your toes, your ankles. And if they're tight, just tense them more. Hold it tight, 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 and then let it go. And your knees, your calves, your neck. Do a body scan. Any part of your body that's still tight, squeeze it hard, and then let it go. And you may feel heavier. Your head may droop. It's okay. But look for any tension in your body right now. And if there is, tighten it as long as you can and then let it go. Again, another deep breath. I am. Exhale, relaxed. Now I want you to imagine it's 80 degree outside, blue skies, beautiful wind. Once you get on your cloud, soft as can be. You lay down and the, then you, it elevates, comes up into the air. And you get to see the topography. And you feel the suns on your cheek rays and on your arms. It's warm. Maybe catch a whiff of lilac or peach blossom or pine. You hear kids playing in the playground. You're so peaceful. Then I want you to tell your cloud to take you to your happy place, your safe place. And as you're getting closer, you see it in the distance. Gets closer and starts descending. And it lands. I want you to get off. And I want you to do whatever you need to do, want to do. To let your senses all become alive. Tactile, auditory, <coughs> visual, olfactory. Feel the sand. Feel the breeze. Feel the sun. Hear the waves or the creek. Hear the birds. This is your place. No one can disturb it. Could be a rocking chair there, a hammock there. <coughs> Maybe you just want to sit in the sand. This is your place. 
place. Notice how relaxed you are. And if you're comfortable, invite Jesus to come. See him coming to you. <clears throat> invite him to come sit next to you. And just begin to talk, communicate. Ask him questions you want to ask. And present your fear, your concern, that issue that has bothered you for a while. And ask him, what can you do what should you do? Inter <clears throat> interact with the Lord at your level. Be yourself with him. And if you've gotten what you need or want, and ask for a hug. If you're comfortable with that. And feel his embrace. And thank him for being with you and sharing himself with you. And then when you're ready, say goodbye to him. But the beauty is you can always see him again. You have this special place, just you and he. And then when you're ready, see if you can look for an object that you can kind of put in your pocket to take with you. It's your special place. And then go ahead and get on the cloud again. Lay down, and it lifts off the ground. But there's no sadness or sorrow because this is your place. You can come back as many times as you want. And it gets farther and farther 
in the distance. And then it hovers over the bridge. And you look down and you see yourself in your seat. Relaxed, calm, still. And then come back into your body. You may notice it's kind of light or it's heavy and Notice how relaxed you are. And then slowly begin to <laughs> move your body or arms or legs and open your eyes. When you're ready, How long do you think that took? Look at your watch. How long was it? About 15 minutes, wasn't it? Or a little less? Yeah. You have just found a way to do what? A twofer. <laughs> One, what system did you activate? your parasympathetic nervous system, and then what's the other twofer? You've got to change your beliefs, your mistaken identity, your ideas. Yes. And you can do this whenever you want to. And I'm envious of you people that have right brains. I've had... Uh, anyway, it, uh, let me... Um, Anyone want to share briefly testimony how this experience, if you heard anything, touched you? I know it's kind of scary in a large group. Anybody? I want to hear about some of these, okay? So here's my email. Write my email down now. <laughs> As I want to follow through if you've had something I'm giving you and for me. If it's like, Grant, this happened to me and I'm not sure what, and then you email me. It is Grant Jones, PhD, at gmail.com. Grant Jones, PhD, at gmail.com. And I will be glad to follow up with anything that you've experienced. Anybody want to share? It can be, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes. When I actually thought he was walking up here. Yes. You know, I didn't expect him to just cry. I understand. Thank you. Anybody else? So here's what we're going to do now. All right. I want us to stand. <clears throat> and. If, if, if you can, can you all just come up here? If you can. Because I just want, and you can face me, you don't have to face, because I want to pray over all of you. And I'm going back to my junior high roots. I can actually have an altar call or something, but that's not what this is. Each of you had those fears that you brought tonight, correct? At least one. One especially about how you see yourself. I'm praying, I prayed, Lord, deliver, set us free. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. As you see us. So let me pray. 
Lord, every single person here that is in this service at this altar, you knew would be here before they were even born. How cool is that? And you knew the travails and the struggles that would lead people to come here tonight. And so I pray now, through your Holy Spirit, you will set us free from the negative view we have of ourselves, the sense that we're defective or flawed, the sense that we don't have much worth and value. I pray you will set that free. May we feel your arms of love around us. May every person, Lord, when he or she goes home tonight, puts the head to the pillow, will smile and say, thank you, Lord, for today. Hallelujah. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Jack. Oh, Tristan, I'm sorry, Pastor Tristan. I was going to bring a Joan to Ralph. I was.